Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Health Talk. I'm Peter Ndoro. And coming up on the program today, senior producer Zama Butelezi spoke to a medical doctor from Pumalanga province and her 11-year-old daughter who both contracted COVID-19. After that, we're joined by the Environmental Health Manager from the National Department of Health to talk to us about travel safety and how to protect yourself and others from COVID-19 this festive season. We then speak to the Communications Officer at ER24 about safety at home during the festive season. And finally, we speak to the Project Manager from the South African Depression and Anxiety Group about mental health during the festive season. Now, remember, you can also share your thoughts with us on social media via Twitter, and the Twitter handle is at SABC Health Talk, or you can join us on our Facebook page, uh, SABC Health Talk. Health Talk continues right after this break. Stay with us. The second wave of the COVID pandemic is officially underway in South Africa now. The second wave brings new dangers for back to work and school in 2021 if people don't adhere to safety protocols. Sadly, children are not immune to this deadly virus. Senior producer Zama Butelezi spoke to a medical doctor from Mpumalanga province and her 11-year-old daughter who both contracted COVID-19 and had to be hospitalized. Let's listen to their story. Dr. Butelezi, now in Pilo, thank you so much for talking to us. You were both um, diagnosed with um, coronavirus. Dr. Butelezi, can you tell us what happened? Yes, I'm a doctor, a frontliner, and working in both public sector and in private. So I might have caught up the virus somewhere there. And unfortunately, I brought it home to my daughter. Uh, what symptoms did the both of you present? We started to have diarrhea on Saturday. And then my, it continued Monday, they started to cough, which was followed by a severe respiratory distress that I couldn't breathe. Uh, I couldn't finish sentences when I was talking with patients. Did you even suspect it was COVID? It didn't cross my mind because I was expecting the sore throat, the high temperature, the symptoms that people they usually say. Is. But to me, it was just this uh, diarrhea. Then from there, the coughing with uh, associated with difficulty, especially in speaking. I couldn't finish f uh, sentences without coughing. So I went to the hospital at Mary Clinic in Nelspreet on Monday evening ar around 12, and the test was done. And boom, on, uh, when they check the results, yes, I was COVID positive. Pilo, talk to me about what happened with you. I had um, diarrhea first, and then after a few days, I got a sore throat. After I was done having a sore throat, I had shortness of breathing. After testing positive, Pilo, were you admitted in hospital? What happened? We went to the doctor and then the nurses told us I'm not that sick, I don't look sick and then we they told us she can come back home she can go back home and sleep and then we went back home. The next day my dad is like, No, I'm very sick, let's go to the hospital and then we were I was admitted. How were you feeling at that time? The both of you you've tested positive, you are in hospital. That must have come a uh, 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 I'm sure it was stressful. How were you both feeling? Let me start with you, doctor. My worry was that she's a known asthmatic uh, on treatment. And then I just got scared because no COVID and respiratory tract uh, diseases, it get worse. So when the pediatrician said she can come also in, in the hospital, and I was happy when they said, no, in fact, you are going to be treated in the same ward. Uh, same cubicle. So I become relieved that I will see uh, how she progressing. Bilo, um, since the beginning of COVID-19 um, coronavirus, we've been told that, or we've been reading that it affects older people. You are 11 years old. 
Um, what can you say to young people who are not protecting themselves, thinking COVID, they will not get COVID? Let me tell you, youngsters, people, COVID is real. So it can infect you whether you're young or old. Let also, it can also infect you when you are born yesterday if your parents had it. What you have to do is follow the rules of COVID-19. Well done, Philo, and I'm, I'm so happy you are okay now. Um, Dr. Tilezi, um, I just want to find out from you, uh, as a health professional who is working uh, in the front line of the COVID pandemic, what would you say to people we need to protect um, our health workers? Many of us, this could be our last Christmas if we don't follow the regulation. If you take that sentence and you put it to yourself, you, you can see what the president is saying exactly. So what I want to say is that, can we follow the regulations of, of COVID-19? Let, let's try by all means. If you do, there's no need to travel this year, stay at home. So as frontliners, I'll encourage all of us to make sure that we, we put on our PPE and also encourage the government to make sure that all our hospitals, they have effective PPE. Dr. Telezi and you, Mpilo, thank you so much for this interview. It was quite informative. After the break, we continue our discussion on travel safety and COVID-19. We'll be speaking with the environmental health manager from the National Department of Health. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Health Talk. Now, South Africa is experiencing the second wave of COVID-19 and the provinces uh, with big metros, Western Cape, Eastern Cape, KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng are the key drivers of this new wave. With the festive season upon us, travel can increase your chances of spreading and getting COVID-19. Even though postponing travel and staying at home might be the best way to protect uh, yourself and others from uh, the pandemic, if you are considering traveling, then precautionary measures should be adhered to in order to protect yourself and others from the virus. To talk to us about uh, these, we're now joined by Pam Masilela, who's the Environmental Health Manager from the National Department of Health. Uh, very good morning to you. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Thank you very much, um, Peter. Good morning to you and good morning to the viewers. All right, so we're getting into that festive period now and travel is something that we do almost as a culture in South Africa at this time of the year. And I just wonder, as the Department of Health, what's your biggest concern? So I think um, mainly looking at the reopening of international travel, mm. obviously with that in place there, we run a risk of um, having more cases being introduced into the country. And I think that's the biggest um, risk that we are currently faced with. But we have introduced measures to try and mitigate and reduce the potential um, spread of, of COVID-19 through international travel, whether it's through air travel, um, through the land borders or through the, the maritime and sea travel. All right. Well, let's uh, take a look at some of those measures to reassure the public that you're doing as best as you can. Let's start with air travel. People are coming from all over the world. We don't know what the situations are in their countries. What are the prerequisites for travelers to be allowed to come into South Africa? Okay, so as a department, we've got environmental health practitioners that we've deployed through all the ports of entry and including the airports of entry. And their primary mandate is in to ensure that they implement measures to try and limit and reduce the pot possible spread of COVID-19 into the country. And we do this through various uh, public health measures, um, one of which is the screening measures. We've got temperature screening and we've got a requirement for the completion of a traveler health questionnaire. But the first, first screening measure that would be implemented 
in, particularly in an airport, uh, as you've indicated, is that the port health official or the environmental health practitioner would go on board the aircraft and interview the crew members to find out if there are any travelers that have experienced any symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19 during the course of the travel. Mm -hmm. And if there are travelers that have experienced those um, sim symptoms, then they are then managed in line with the protocols. And once the travelers have disembarked from the aircraft, there are other measures um, that we are implementing. The first one is temperature screening. So they'll be taken through a non-invasive temperature screening to ensure that their temperature is within the required range. And they'll also be required to complete a traveler health questionnaire where they will detail their symptoms, where they'll de detail their risk um, exposure and indicate whether they've um, come into contact with somebody who was possibly infected yeah. or they themselves have tested uh, previously. So all these measures that we've introduced is ensure that we early identify and early detect a possible risk uh, traveler that may possibly um, transmit the infection to other travelers. A lot of countries are, are demanding that people get tested for COVID-19 before departure. Is that something we're going to see a lot more of? So with the countries that are, with the travelers that are coming into the country, one of those uh, requirements is the, the production of a negative PCR test result that was obtained not older than 72 hours um, on departure. So every traveler that is coming through any of our ports of entry is required to be in possession mm -hmm. um, of that certificate. There are other countries that require this certificate as a condition of entry, and we encourage South Africans or any other traveler that is traveling outside of the country to find out what their requirements are in their country of um, um, uh, arrival and to ensure that they adhere with those requirements. But as a country and, and in South Africa, we do require travelers who are coming in to produce that negative COVID-19 uh, test uh, result. All right. Um, what, what are we doing about uh, South Africans coming home? They've been abroad studying, um, living abroad, and they're coming home. Uh, how are we dealing with those? Because, again, they could be at risk. No, definitely. And I think the, the issue of South Africans coming home, we started that even when borders were, were closed. You'll recall that when international travel was closed, um, we still were permitted or South Africans were still allowed to come back home through the repatriation uh, process and um, implementing those same health measures on their arrival into the country to ensure that they are safe and to ensure that they are not infected and they do not have the possibly possibility of actually transmitting the disease to, to other South Africans. So the same measures would still apply to South Africans. They'd be taken through the screening processes. They'd be required to produce that test result. And they, if, on, on production of a negative test result, then they'd be allowed entry into, into the country. In many ways, the airports perhaps are much easier to deal with. Uh, land borders uh, is a different ball game altogether. If I think about Bight Bridge and the thousands and thousands of people that are crossing every single day, do you have the capacity to make sure that uh, uh, movement is safe? Yeah, definitely. I think as a department, we, we can comfortably say that we do have the capacity. When the outbreak started and it was declared as a pandemic by the WHO, we deployed an additional close to 300 environmental health practitioners to the various border posts and particularly in the land borders to ensure that we increase the capacity and the human resources to be able to implement the measures that we need to implement to protect the public and to protect the, the travelers. And as you've rightfully said, with the land uh, borders, it's, it's a different ball game um, altogether, particularly now with the festive season. There's a lot of movements in between through our borders, our land borders. And we've put in place that same requirement for PCR testing in the, the land borders. However, in consideration of the frequent travel, we've allowed those who travel frequently within the land borders to um, have a test result that is uh, valid for 14 days. So their test results will remain valid uh, for 14 days. So any, any frequent travelers, but on their initial entry, that test result must still comply with the 72 hour time period and any subsequent entry following that will be valid for 14 days. All right, a lot of people are traveling by coach. If you find someone who's suspect on the coach, what happens to all the other passengers uh, that were on the coach with them? What's the protocol? 
So the protocols in place, the first thing that we need to do is isolate the, the case itself, the person mm. who's been suspected themselves, and then identify the close contacts. And in, a instance, in an instance such as a coach, considering the nature of transmission of the virus, we would then identify the, the contacts, which would possibly be the entire um, coach for that period, and uh, implement then the protocols that are in place for contact tracing and ensure that they are quarantined where there's a need for them to be tested they are tested and they remain in quarantine for quarantining them for the for the 10 day period prior to them um being able to then proceed with 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 um, other business on and that would obviously be on us um, um confirming that they did not experience any symptoms during that quarantine period so there is that process of identifying close contacts and high-risk contacts contact and also low-risk contact, contacts and managing them as such. All right. So what's your advice to people regards interprovincial travel? Because we're going to see much more of that, I guess. I think, as the president said, limit travel. Um, mm. If you absolutely need to travel, then ensure that you implement the health protocols that are in place. You ensure that you are always wearing your mask. You ensure that you maintain a safe um, distance and you practice good hand hygiene, whether it's washing your hands um, with soap and water or using hand sanitizers. But ensure that you keep safe at all times. If you're using public transport, make sure you've got your mask um, worn at all times. Ensure there's good ventilation in the, in the public transport. But where you absolutely can avoid travel, the advice is rather stay home with your close uh, family and enjoy the festive season with your close family. Um, who should be testing? You know, there's this, uh, we're starting to see statistics of younger and younger people um, testing positive for COVID-19. Um, and there was a long time we thought that young people were almost immune to this. So what are we saying now in terms of who should be testing and uh, being concerned? If you're experiencing any symptoms, if you've been in close contact, first, if you've been in close contact with somebody who has been uh, confirmed as a, a COVID positive uh, case, then you definitely need to undergo testing. If you're experiencing any symptoms, you definitely will need to undergo testing. But remember, we must also remember that we've got health professionals in the different um, municipalities, in the different provinces, who will then be able to advise in terms of a, in using a risk-based approach, which um, persons will be undergoing the, the required um, testing. But definitely, if you're showing symptoms, you need to be tested so that you can be um, ruled out if, if you're not infected. All right, and where can one get tested and is there a cost? So, um, are you referring to international travel? Uh, no, or no, are domestic, you South Africans here at home. So, yes, yeah, so we've mm. got both the private laboratories and we also have the public lab laboratories that um, offer testing and um, uh, the prices, I think for the private labs, the, 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 the prices differ. I'm, I'm not too sure at this point in time in terms of the, the cost related to the testing, but we've got both private and public laboratories that can provide the testing. All right, and perhaps uh, to wrap it up, your final advice to South Africans, uh, whether they're here at home or traveling abroad, what do they need to know that's very, very important? I cannot stress enough observing the protocols that have been put in place, the health protocols that have been put in place. Maintain your social distance, um, ensure that you are wearing a mask, practice good hand hygiene, and finally, download the COVID mm -hmm. SA Alert app. It will go a long way in assisting us in identifying close contacts and in us preventing or, 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 or limiting the spread of, of COVID-19. So ensure that you adhere to the, the regulations that have been put in place for the containment of COVID and download the COVID um, SA Alert app. All right, Pam Masilela, thanks so much indeed for joining us. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, that's uh, Pam Masilela, Environmental Health Manager at the National Health Department, uh, urging us uh, to play safe uh, this holiday season. Now, after the break, we continue with our discussion on safety at home, and we speak to the communications officer at uh, ER24. Stay with us.
holiday season is upon us and the public will start making their way to various holiday destinations, resulting in high volumes of traffic and people spending long hours on our roads. Now, this could increase in the number of road fatalities, sadly, whilst others, because of COVID-19 pandemic, have opted to stay at home. And unfortunately, no one is exempt from the health risks that come with the holiday season. To talk to us a little bit about uh, how we can avoid some of these health risks, we're now joined by Russell Mehring, who's the Communication Officer at ER24. A very good morning to you, Russell. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on the show. All right, so this time of the year, um, you were always busy anyway. Uh, the pandemic just doubles the trouble. Indeed, uh, the festive season is always very busy for any emergency service, including ER24. But now this is obviously compounded by the, the pandemic and the strict laws that we have in place to try to curb, obviously, the, mm. the increase that we are having. I suppose there are the usual risks, uh, but, and we'll talk about those now. But what are the new risks that you're bringing into account uh, this festive season when compared to this time last year, for example? Well, obviously, a lot of people are going on holiday at this time, uh, moving down to their various destinations, including KZN, in Western Cape. But obviously, these areas are seeing a very high increase in the number of um, COVID-19. So there are stringent, uh, excuse me, stringent laws and, and regulations in place. But obviously, it's very difficult to try keep social distancing and sanitizing in place um, during the holiday, You whether you go to the beach, um, or water parks, whatever the case may be, it can be very difficult to implement these. All right, and then the normal risks at this time that we shouldn't forget. What are you finding normally are the things that perhaps because we're in a holiday mood, we tend to be a bit lax about certain things. And what are those things that you see that you want to warn the public about now? Well, we're still obviously seeing a heavy amount of traffic um, towards the destinations in three um, and various uh, routes like that. Obviously, we are still urging the members of the public and motorists to obviously adhere to all the rules of the road. We have unfortunately attended to quite a few um, serious and large incidents, some of them involving fatalities with people moving down, um, not obeying the rules of the road, some of them where alcohol may have been a contributing factor to, to the incident. So we are seeing a very high rise in our trauma-related incidents, um, even though during the pandemic. People are staying at home as well, and uh, they're not going to work, they're in the house. What do you find you're normally getting called out to deal with at home? What are the home risks? We are obviously still dealing with your various medical cases, which can happen at any time. Uh, with a large amount of people staying at home, we can see a large amount of accidents or incidents. Um, some of these can in, uh, involve children, whether playing, climbing things, uh, burning themselves um, on whether it's a stove or um, uh, hot water yeah. from a kettle, things like that. So these are the most common incidents that we do respond to. Um, we do find sometimes um, we get gender-based violence or um, incidents involving alcohol, which is always especially high during this, this time. All right, so what's your advice to, to people? I mean, you know, what, when, when <laughs> uh, I, I'm a parent, I've got a child, um, I've got a family, what should I be conscious of more than ever before? Well, one of the first things, and we, we're urging every single person out there, is obviously the, the pandemic doesn't take a holiday, mm. no matter what. Um, even though, and we've been under uh, quite a bit of strain for the past several months, and I do understand that a lot of people want to to try take it easy, take a holiday, but we we cannot take it easy. We cannot lax on on these uh, things that have been implemented to try help us. So, still, whether you are staying at home, popping to the shops, going on a holiday, you still need to wear your mask. You still need to uh, maintain social distancing and sanitize with obviously an alcohol an alcohol based yeah. um, sanitizer and keep these things in mind at all times uh, for people that are going on holiday um, and driving these long distances obviously obey all the rules of the road we are seeing that traffic is increasing exponentially daily obviously because now people are trying to yeah. get to to their destination so obviously obey the rules of the road stop as often as possible just to try relax um, and uh, especially now it's 
raining in Johannesburg, so a lot of people out on the roads. Maintain safe following distances. Stay off your cell phone, obviously, if you do need to use it, pull over safely to the side of the road and use it. And especially with alcohol, take it easy during this festive season. Give us some advice about, um, you know, often what happens at this time of the year, brothers and sisters with their families converge at their parents' houses or at holiday homes. And so now you've got different households coming together. Do we still think about the mask protocol, even though these are my brother's children and family, but I haven't been spending time with them and they're coming from different places? Absolutely. Um, the festive season is time for family and friends, but obviously a lot of people don't take the wearing of the mask and sanitizing and social distancing into, into hand. So we should still practice social distancing, wearing masks and sanitizing as you may, be, you may be keeping safe, but you don't know who your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, or your friends have been in contact with. And it is imperative that we still uphold these high um, levels of safety and still make sure that if you are going to see your family and friends, uh, make sure to social distance, make sure to wear a mask, and make sure to sanitize. And talk to us a little bit about, uh, I hear about uh, rather sit outside than inside, windows open for ventilation. Does that make a difference? Absolutely. Well, the Department of Health has said that um, sitting outside is preferable um, in a well-ventilated area. So if you can, we have some very beautiful weather in our country. So while you're out um, with some family, if you can sit outside or in a well-ventilated area, do so. Obviously, hand in hand with wearing your mask. Um, and sanitizing yeah. as often as possible. And um, it's also said that uh, should you be going to family lunch during Christmas or, or the very other holidays, make sure to try and bring your own cutlery and crockery as well. This can help aid in, in the spread. All right. The yeah, the spread, I should say. We're going to see these uh, road accidents on the side of the road. And before people would jump in straight away to try and help, in a COVID environment, what kind of assistance can people give? What should they be doing and thinking about? Well, one thing we always urge people is that if you are going to stop, make sure that you stop in a safe place. Mm. You don't want to become another statistic. So stop in a safe place and immediately call emergency services. That is the first step in helping. All right, just jumping in by yourself and not getting the right authorities to scene is not necessarily going to do any, any good. So make sure that you stop in a safe place and call the local authorities and your emergency services. From there, you should still have your, your mask with you at all times. Mm. It's also recommended to keep a little first aid kit in the car. Utilizing this, if there are any injuries on scene, you will be able to help your patient. Obviously, social distancing while helping a patient is not really advisable. Yeah. You can't really do it. So make sure if you have a visor to use it as well as a mask. Um, most first aid kits do have some sort of safety goggles and make sure to wear your gloves and then you can render any first aid assistance to your patient. All right, let's uh, look at some first aid tips. I know that there's only so much you can explain uh, on, on a situation like this, but burns are common. Um, if you get burnt by boiling water or something, what, what do you do? Well, there are unfortunately a lot of old wives tales and myths yeah. around burns. Um, and, and we've heard of them all, whether it's putting Zambac or oil or egg and things like that. None of this works. So one of the first things we need to do with any burn is to stop the burning process. Mm. All right. So immediately under cool running water, all right, and we leave it there for some time all right, to cool the burn. Right. If we have any burn products that can be placed over that, we should do so. If we don't have a burn shield or anything like that, a a moist dressing. So if you have a bandage under some uh, cold water and wrap the burn in that, and then obviously get your, your patient or your loved one off to hospital. We don't want to put any mm. foreign substance, any creams, things like that, because once they get to hospital, it's going to be removed. And a lot of these creams um, or home remedies can actually cause more harm than good. All right. What about uh, kids? They're always picking up things and drinking things. Uh, they drink some chemicals, for example. What do you do in a situation like that? Well, this can obviously be very serious and life-threatening. Um, so in the first place, uh, rather err on the side of the caution and make sure that all your chemicals and medications are locked away. Mm. So your cleaning materials under a sink in a locked cupboard 
and your medications in a medication cabinet, or you can buy a little uh, small safety lockbox and keep that away from kids. Uh, a lot of the time, these chemicals and medications will make your child vomit. And we don't want to stop the vomiting, but we also don't want to induce the vomiting. A lot of these chemicals, whether it, let's say, for example, bleach, can actually burn. Um, mm. So if we induce vomiting, can actually cause a lot of damage to um, to your child. So rather phone um, your emergency services, you can phone ER24 and inform and say, my child has drunk this or has drunk an unknown medication. And we can advise from there the steps to uh, to take and obviously get your child or a loved one off to hospital. And I suppose take those chemicals to the hospital so the doctors can Absolutely. see what it is. All right, so if you are, know what they took, yeah. uh, such as you know they drank bleach or you know they took a, a painkiller, yeah. whatever the case may be, um, if you aren't able to take the, the medication, the bottle um, will do as, far, uh, as well. All right. What about choking? Because that's something also that's not uncommon, sadly. Um, and it's between children, <laughs> adults, we're all vulnerable. What, what do you do? Absolutely. Well, this is why we always urge people to at least have a first aid course to learn how to do the Heimlich maneuver. Mm. All right. It obviously differs from a child to an adult, obviously, with mm. the signs. But the technique that you will be doing, especially for an adult, is your Heimlich maneuver, where you will stand behind them, all right, place your arms around them just above the navel and make a fist, and you will be doing sharp thrusts into their abdomen up to hopefully remove the object. For a young child or a baby would be a bit different where you are doing five back slaps and yeah. then turning them over and doing five chest compressions. This obviously does require a bit of training. So it's recommended that you can go do a small first aid course to learn some of this. All right. And then, you know, it's it's quite hot at this time of the year. Fainting. What What do you do when someone has fainted or passed out? Well, absolutely. Fainting can happen for many reasons. Um, and we've seen, again, a lot of home remedies and a lot of myths. Now, fainting can be quite serious if we don't know the reason. So we always say place your patient in the recovery position or put them on their side. All right. This is to maintain their open airway. Don't try to give them any water. All right. If they have fainted, they can't drink and they could choke. All right. So place them on their side. It, if uh, one of the most common reasons could be um, heat injury, so they've overheated, yeah. move them to a safe location or out of the heat, place them on their side, and you can place cool, damp cloths on their forehead, on their chest, and under their arms. Um, should they stay unconscious for a prolonged um, period of time, a couple of minutes, this is when you would call the emergency services. All right. Russell, we could go on forever, but uh, I think Absolutely. what you've shared with us is quite important. And let's just hope that people are more vigilant uh, this Christmas because uh, it is uh, a dangerous time that we're living through, not just the normal risks, but also COVID-19. But thanks so much indeed and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. And we wish everyone a happy and safe festive season. Great. Thanks so much indeed. That's uh, Russell Mehring, who's uh, communications manager at ER24. Again, please take care. And uh, there are the usual risks and we need to be really vigilant. But also on top of that, of course, COVID-19, social distancing, all of that. It doesn't matter if it's family that you haven't seen for a while. They too could be a risk. So be careful. Wear the mask, social distance. Eat outside rather than inside, ventilate your homes, sanitize, you know the protocols, do them. After the break, we continue with our discussion on mental health as we speak with the project manager from the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. Welcome back, you're still watching Health Talk. Stress and depression can ruin your holidays and hurt your health. Being realistic, planning ahead and seeking support can help ward off stress and depression. As the world battles the COVID-19 pandemic and the strain it has put on economies, many people are stressed and depressed and have anxiety levels uh, have increased because of uh, uh, loss, uh, health issues, uh, uncertainty about the future, amongst many other things. But there is help available. Uh, Venetia Gordon is the project manager from the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, SADAC, and she joins us this morning to discuss mental health during the festive season. Uh, very good morning to you. Thanks so much indeed for, for joining us. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. 
So this time of the year normally is a festive period and people are theoretically very happy. But sadly, there are some people at this time of the year that it goes the other way. Have you been getting a number of calls uh, already this uh, festive season, um, particularly with the backdrop of COVID-19? I think definitely this year has been a very difficult year. Um, SADC has seen an increase of calls as soon as we went into lockdown. So as soon as we went into the initial lockdown, we actually received more than double the calls. Our last month's calls actually reached uh, 1,500 calls per day, whereas pre-COVID, it was only 600 calls calls a day and we still thought that was a lot mm. it was a lot of calls coming in so definitely now during this space of time um test of season you know you you would get different types of calls so people experiencing loneliness um mm. you know the christmas time or the festive season can bring up a lot of stress whether it comes from finances and i think this year is going to be even more because of finances and job security and all the different factors that are coming into play because we're in such a difficult situation. And I suppose by the time somebody picks up a phone to call you, a lot has happened and they're in a pretty uh, bad situation. I think definitely. And I think it's so important for us to be aware of how we're feeling and how our loved ones are feeling so that we can make that call earlier. So if you're noticing, you know, you're not feeling well, you're feeling extra stressed, you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, you're not managing the daily uh, functions normally and you're feeling that extra pressure, I think it's so important that when you start feeling that way, mm -hmm. to reach out, speak to a loved one or phone into the call center, speak to a counselor where you can get that information to help you better manage it before it's too late. Mm. How do we know the difference? Because, you know, this time of the year, we normally feel quite tired. We normally feel like I've got that end of the year blues. We have these different names, but there is a point at which it's a little bit more than just fatigue, isn't it? Definitely, definitely a little bit more. And I think in, in this situation that we're sitting in where we have been under lockdown, we have been isolated, we can't go exactly where we want to go. We were in a very severe lockdown that was obviously, I mean, we went from being completely free, mm. that I could go to a shop and go buy everything I wanted and not have to make that list and say, okay, I'm going to go once a month. I'm not going to go every other day when I need something small. So our whole lives have been changed. And I think it's so important to understand that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to feel anxious, but it's also good to say, you know, if I'm feeling this way, maybe I should reach out. Maybe I should speak to a counselor and that's okay as well, just so that you can get the help that you need even if it's those small mm. things. And I sadly, because we're getting into that zone where matric results are on the horizon and uh, it's been a difficult year in terms of study, are you worried about what might be happening uh, to young people right now? So definitely, I mean, it, the, the situation is so that they had to adapt to online mm. learning. And I think if you and I were we're needing to adapt to such an online yeah. learning platform, it would be just as difficult. I think we've all struggled through the year, especially the young ones. And SADC has always seen callers calling in from the age of 11 till the elderly. So there's never been mm -hmm. just the young people phoning or just, you know, the elderly people or middle age. It's been through across the board. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they, a lot of the matriculants also remember they also have to now move on to going to university, and that's also going to be a transition because university students have also mm -hmm. felt that pressure because they had to go from meeting a lecturer day, every day, going to touch classes, being active, having their peers around, to online learning as well at home. What should parents and caregivers be looking out for uh, to perhaps give them a clue that, you know what, maybe my child's not okay? I think it's so important to have that conversation. It's to create that dialogue. If you're noticing your child has, it, their, their personality has changed just a little bit. You know, you're noticing that they're not sitting and watching TV. They're isolating themselves in their room. 
um, they might be sleeping a lot more, speak to them, create that conversation where, you know, you ask them, be like, how are you doing today? And they can do the same for you. So I think it's, it's creating that conversation and creating that environment of support where, you know, you can come to me if you're not feeling well, you can come to me if you're feeling too stressed, I'm here to support you. And if you want to speak to someone, there's always this helpline where you can get confidential information, you can, I mean, I mean, sorry, confidential resources, and you don't have to tell anyone else about it. You can just say, you know what, this is how I'm feeling. Share that uh, emotion, share, share that experiences and get the help that you need, whether it be needing to go to a doctor, whether it be needing just that, that telephone conversation to help you feel a little bit better and getting the self-help tips that might help you on your day-to-day -day routine. Again, this time of the year, um, we buy lots of alcohol and that's part of, uh, I guess, uh, the holiday spirit. How do we know when perhaps our alcohol consumption is more than just having a good time, that it perhaps is masking other problems? I think it's so important for those who already have a mental illness or are feeling anxious, do not use alcohol as mm. a, a, a numbing mm. um, you know, you know, uh, substance. Just try and say, okay, how am I feeling about it? How is this making me feel? You know, sort of limit your, um, be, drink responsibly or abstain completely. You have to decide. And if you're not sure and you need to ask a little bit more questions, phone in, speak to a counselor, speak to your loved ones, let them know how you're feeling about it and let them know that sorry, let them know that you're feeling stressed. So that's why you're either not drinking today or you can't drink or you would like to just abstain. I think it's important and I always say this and it's something that I say, I think in all the interviews or any one of the interactions that I have, whether it be talks or not, it's starting that conversation. It's having that conversation. And I think that's the first step for creating the awareness and letting the loved one know that you're not doing well. And also, you know, making yourself feel like, you know, yeah. I can speak, I can say I'm not feeling well, and it's okay to, be, to speak about it. Talk to us a little bit about uh, family dynamics. Um, a lot of us are gonna have to stay at home. Uh, lockdown, we saw family relationships take a bit of strain. Uh, now we're on holiday, some of us <laughs> haven't, haven't gotten back to work. and. Normally, where there's lots of presents under the tree, they aren't there. You've been stuck in the house together for a long time. How do we manage this, this dynamic? Because I can only imagine that what should be a festive time might be quite difficult when you're contained. I think it's also, I think that's something that South Africans will struggle with in general. Yeah. And I think that's what we struggled with when we initially went into lockdown. Yeah. We are very outside people we are very bry and call my friends people so i think uh, that's definitely something that's going to feel different we are in summer we want to do all of these things now we have to be in the space and also it's dangerous to go outside not dangerous but it's it's you know it's one of those things that are risky and definitely financial issues are huge this year where people have lost their jobs, um, they have l worked limited hours, I mean less hours, so obviously their pay is not as much, so definitely there'll be less presence, there'll be less, you know, festivities as to mm -hmm. say, but I think it's important that even within that family set or within that household, it's important to, you know, for parents to let their children know that this is the situation, this is how it is, be open about what's going on, whether it be the job security, whether it be the finances, whether it be how you're feeling, whether it be um, the fact that you're stressed because you might still have to work through December because, you know, you need to. And I think it's all of that. And it's also being able to give yourself that space. And this year has taught us that self-care mm. is so important. You know, um, looking after yourself, being aware of how you're feeling. I think it's so important for each and every person to create that routine where self-care is in that routine. You know, in the morning, if you wanna do a quick breathing exercise, you take that 15 minutes, you do that. You know, it's all of those little breaks that you take to look after yourself is gonna be the most important and the most beneficial for the longest mm. term. Isolation is another 
um, challenge, um, particularly this year where normally you might have children coming to visit and they're not going to come this year. Uh, you live alone and people are social distancing. And this is a vulnerable time, isn't it, for people perhaps who do live alone and they're not going to be getting visitors. Definitely. And that is something that um, through the festive season has always been the nature of a lot of calls that come in through to SADAC, where people are feeling lonely, um, they, they're experiencing grief because they have either they've lost someone or they lost a loved one, and they're alone at home. And I think it's so important that even during this COVID space, where we said this in, I think, during lockdown as well, is that Keep the video calling, keep calling your loved ones, you know, maintain that connection. Um, call them, send them a voice note, say, you know, send them a voice note and be like, you know, how are you doing today? Or send them a cute message, create that conversation that is still there and that support that is still there so they know that that someone is still there. I think for families, it's going to be very difficult where I know a lot of kids will bring, you know, they'll bring their, their children and themselves and they'll go to go see the grandmother or they'll go to go visit their parents in different areas. And I think this year it's going to be very difficult to, um, you know, go towards that and actually have that big festive, mm -hmm. you know, occasion where you have that massive um, Christmas lunch or something to that effect. But keep the video calling you know, phone your family members, have that conversation and, you know, just do check-ins, just yeah. general check-ins. And to be honest, if anybody is feeling lonely and they're feeling isolated, please know that SADAG mm. is available. Please call in and speak to a counselor. You can even go onto the website where there are videos and articles and information there's a lot of self-help tips. And if you're not wanting to call in, you can always SMS us and then a counselor will call you back. All right. How do we know the difference between I'm just feeling a bit down today and I'm depressed? I think it's very, I'm, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, yeah. but it is that consistent feeling. So if, mm. and you would know, you would know that, you know, I'm not feeling too well. Okay, today I'm not feeling too well. Let's try and, you know, go out for a walk and see how that feels. And the next day you're still not feeling too well. Reach out, mm. reach out and ask for help. It's okay to not feel okay. And it's okay to reach out and get that assistance, even if it's just a self-help tip. All right. And then finally, are you going to be open throughout uh, the holiday season? If so, how can people get hold of you and what, how will you be able to help them? So SADAG uh, works 365 days a year. We are open right through the festive season, right through the year. We're always here to help 24 hours a day. We have helplines where you can call in on 0800-456789 or 0800-567-567. You can SMS us and a council will call you back on 31393. And also have a look at our website. We have so much information. There's so many videos. There's little tidbits. There's little tips and um, self-help tips that you can actually sort of, you know, use on your daily basis. It is www.sadag, S-A-D-A-G dot org. Venetia, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so, so much for the uh, very important work that you do. And uh, we wish you strength uh, in the work that you do and helping our people throughout this uh, difficult time. Thanks so much indeed. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, okay. thank you. All right, that was uh, Venetia Godan, who's the project manager at uh, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, SADAG. If you're feeling something, feeling you know the difference, uh, please uh, reach out, call before uh, it's too late. All right, and that's uh, where we say goodbye. Thank you so, so much indeed for joining us uh, for this edition of Health Talk. Don't forget, the only way to manage this pandemic is if we all play safe and protect each other. Do the protocols. Stay at home, social distance, wash your hands, wear a mask, uh, stay outdoors as much as you can. And uh, I will see you in, uh, next time. But in the meantime, uh, take care of each other. Bye-bye.